Hello friends. Welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Neha Verma. There are many instances that raise concerns about the safety of women, it, even in the present day. In June 2011, a similar event occurred in the lovely city of India. Three women were discovered murdered in their residence, and it took the authorities several days to pinpoint the perpetrators. The query persists, who was responsible for this triple homicide, and what drove them to kill these three women? Let's delve deeper into the Deshanda family murders case. In 2011, Mega Deshbande, 42 years old, resided in the upscale area of Srinagar in the city of Indore with her 21-year-old daughter, Ashlesha, and her 70-year-old mother, Rohini. It is noteworthy that Indore has repeatedly been ranked as the cleanest city in India. Srinagar is known for its affluent residents, indicating the Deshpande family's strong financial status. Mega Deshpande worked in a multi-level marketing MLM company for a considerable period. MLM, also known as network marketing, direct selling, operates by connecting individuals to the company through a network. This system allows for continuous profit generation for the company owner as more people join the network. Before residing in Indore, Mega lived in the city of Ujjain with her husband and the rest of the family, which is about 35 miles away from Indore. However, a few months ago, Mega shifted her home with her daughter and mother. Mega's husband, Nanjay, was a bank manager, so he had to stay in Ujjain. Nanjay was a bank manager, and Mega was a senior employee at an MLM company, so they had no financial worries. Mega's family also had a strong relationship with their neighbors, and all the residents in this community were sensible. So far, there had been no crimes that could cause fear among the people, but something happened in this area on June 13, 2011, which shook the entire city of Indore. During that time, nobody had left Mega's house until noon, and no one's voice was heard. However, suddenly, one of Mega Desh Pandey's neighbors walked by her house and noticed something very unusual. There were footprints with blood stains around Mega's house. This sight alarmed her, prompting her to quickly call the authorities to investigate Mega's house. After that, the neighbor also knocked on the door of the house several times, but there was no response from inside. Then, they tried to look up inside the house through a window, but upon seeing what was inside, he screamed loudly because he saw three women lying on the ground in the house with blood all around their bodies. After this, in a state of panic, the neighbor quickly informed the police about it. For the police, this case was completely different because such an incident had never happened in the Srinagar area. Now gradually, many people of this society came to know about this incident. And by the time the police reached the crime scene, a large crowd had gathered outside the Dishpande family's house. Then, the police entered the house and were surprised to see the bodies of three women who had been brutally murdered by the criminals. They seized the crime scene and began their investigation, discovering two bullet shells inside the house. A police officer observed that Mega had been fatally shot in the head but they could not locate the second bullet, despite thoroughly searching every corner of the house. After this, the police called in the forensic team to start collecting evidence from the crime scene, and then the dead bodies of these three women were sent for post-mortem. By this time, not only Srinagar, but the entire city of Indore was shocked with this news. A few hours later, the post-mortem report is presented to the police revealing that the murders of 21-year-old Asleha and her 70-year-old grandmother Rohini were due to excessive bleeding with multiple stab wounds inflicted on their bodies. This report also makes it clear that only Mega Deshpande was shot to death. But now, the biggest question before the police was if they have found two bullet shells, then on whom was the second shot fired? On the other hand, Mega's husband and the general public started demanding a quick solution to the case so the culprits could be punished. The police felt the increasing pressure from the public and a sense of urgency to solve the case quickly. Consequently, 
several teams were deployed by the police to investigate. One team examined the call detail records of the victims, while another team rechecked the forensic evidence. At first, the police found out that at the crime scene, there was blood of an additional person besides Mega, Ashlesha, and Rohini, and the police knew it was likely a man. A case of robbery and murder was filed, as it appeared that theft had taken place at the Deshbanda family's residence. Later, investigations revealed that there were multiple calls made to Mega's phone from a specific number, and Mega had lengthy conversations with this number. Now the police extracted complete information about this number, from where it was revealed to the police that this number belonged to a girl named Neha Verma. Now the police had also started tracking the location of the girl so that they could talk to her regarding this case, which might provide them with some leads. On the other hand, the police now also had a sample of that blood which was separate from Mega, Ashlesha and Rohini at the crime scene. Then one day, suddenly the police find out that Neha is near an ATM in that area. After that, a team of police reached there and brought Neha to the police station to talk to her. Now Neha was told about the entire scene, which left Neha completely astonished. After that, Neha explained how she met Mega. Mega and Neha met for the first time in a shopping mall. Neha accidentally bumped into Mega while rushing through the mall. Mega was holding some items in her hand, which fell down due to the collision. Neha then apologized and helped Mega pick up the fallen items. During this time, there was a lot of conversation between them, so much so that Neha herself went to drop Mega to the car, and from here onwards, their friendship started. Neha discovered that Mega works at a company involved in multi-level marketing, MLM. They exchanged phone numbers the same day and started talking occasionally. Neha was curious about the MLM business model, so she would discuss it with Mega. However, the police became suspicious of Neha's story because her words and body language didn't align. As a result, they questioned Neha extensively. Neha tried to conceal her lie briefly, but she couldn't withstand the police interrogation for long. Eventually, she confessed a story that shocked even the police. Neha, a 23-year-old, was beautiful and cheerful. Although she was a beautician, her financial situation wasn't good enough for her to fulfill her dreams. Neha's father was an ordinary van driver, which meant their financial condition wasn't great enough for Neha to pursue her dreams. It was during this time that Neha met a guy named Rahul Choudhury. They developed a good friendship, which eventually turned into love. Rahul, at 24, was handsome, but his financial situation was the same as Neha's. Despite this, they loved each other deeply and wanted to marry, so they were searching for a way to become rich overnight and live their lives comfortably. One day, Neha met Mega. Mega had a fondness for wearing expensive jewelry, so whenever she went out, she adorned herself with her jewels. The day Mega met Neha for the first time, she was decked out in gold jewelry, which indicated to Neha that Mega was very wealthy, sparking the idea in Neha's mind to get close to Mega Deshpande and befriend her. Subsequently, Neha deliberately bumped into Mega to strike up a conversation, and thus their interactions began. Now, gradually, due to talking through a call, the thought of robbing Mega came into Neha's mind. After this, Neha included her boyfriend Rahul in her plan. She told Rahul that she has conversations with a woman who is very wealthy, and the added advantage is that there are no men in her house, so it will be easy to rob her. Hearing this idea, Rahul also becomes happy because by doing this, both of their financial situations would improve, and then they could live comfortably after getting married. From that day on, Rahul began to plan the murders of these three women. He believed that if he successfully killed them without anyone finding out, there would be no one to report them. With a complete plan in place, Rahul only needed a gun to carry out the deed. His friend Manoj, who was close to both Rahul and Neha, provided him with one as he also had a gun. With the means to execute his plan, Rahul started searching for the right day to make his move against Mega and her family. On June 13, 2011, Neha contacted Mega 
to join her MLM scheme, Mega was pleased to have Neha on board. Unbeknownst to Mega, this day would bring unforeseen tragedy. Neha arrived at Mega's house early the next morning. Mega asked Neha to fill out a form for the company, but Neha was unsure about the required information. She requested help from her friend and Mega approved. Neha then contacted her boyfriend, Rahul. Now according to the plan, Rahul and Manoj were waiting for Neha's call, and then shortly after that, Rahul and Manoj went to Mega's house. But as soon as Rahul entered the house, he showed Mega a gun, and then, a few seconds later, he shot Mega, causing her to die on the spot. The sound of the gunshot didn't go out of their house, because Rahul had shot very close, but the sound of this gunshot reached Ashlesha and Rohini's ears, causing both of them to run into the lobby. After that, first Rahul and Manoj frightened Ashlesha and Rohini, and asked for her ATM card and PIN to save their lives. In order to save her life, Ashlesha quickly gave her ATM card and handed it to Rahul. She felt that now these people would leave. But now because Ashlesha and her grandmother had seen Neha, Rahul, and Manoj's faces, so now these three were afraid that after they leave, these two might inform the police. So Rahul first tried to shoot Ashlesha, but in haste, this bullet hit Rahul's own foot. Afterwards, Manoj brutally murdered Ashlesha and elderly Rohini with a knife. Afterwards, these three criminals stole 1,000 Indian rupees, valuable jewelry worth up to half a million Indian rupees, and Ash's ATM card before leaving the house. Surprisingly, it was the same ATM card Neha was planning to withdraw money from, but she was later caught by the police. Rahul was captured after going to a police station with a fake first information report and then being hospitalized locally due to a gunshot wound in his foot. Nonetheless, when the police compared Rahul's blood sample taken from the crime scene with his own, it was a match. The police quickly solved this case and captured the criminals, resulting in much praise for their city's police force. Subsequently, this case remained in court for a long time but eventually, in December 2013, the district court sentenced these three criminals to death by hanging. These killers had wiped out the entire Deshpande family line by murdering women from three different generations. Moreover, the police found bloodied clothes, knives, and jewelry in possession of these criminals. Neha Verma is currently incarcerated in the central jail, where she is teaching a beauty parlor course to other female inmates. It should also be noted that this was the first time the district court had pronounced capital punishment for a woman. Mega's husband, Nanai Deshpande, expressed satisfaction with the court's decision and said he had full confidence in the judiciary and the police did a great job. The aspiration to become rich overnight turned an ordinary girl and boy into criminals. If these criminals had fled to another country after killing and stealing money, they might never have been caught. However, if Mega hadn't worn her valuable jewelry to the mall that day and hadn't trusted a random person, perhaps her family would still be alive today. One lesson to be learned from this is that we shouldn't develop such strong friendships with any stranger in just a few days, that we start inviting them home. Before Paul met Joanne, he had been in serious relationships with women more than once, for example, in 1993, during his university years, he was with Carrie Thompson. Although he didn't stay with her for long, this relationship revealed his violent tendencies. Carrie told the police about how Paul could switch during an argument and become aggressive, beating the walls and holding Carrie by force. This was just the beginning. In 1999, Jenny Mary Clark appeared in his life. They wasted no time and just two weeks after meeting, the wedding bells were already ringing. However, their marriage began with a real nightmare. On their wedding night, Paul attacked Jenny, and this was not a one-off incident. He continued to beat her and even strangled her into unconsciousness. Investigators claimed that this abusive behavior was repeated with Joanne. Despite this situation, Paul and Jenny decided to have a baby. Their daughter, Chloe, was born in 2000, and they divorced shortly after. 
When Chloe was five years old, Jenny met Joanne and immediately realized that Joanne was too naive for such a rude man and would face a tough battle with Paul. In 2002, he broke up with Jenny and began dating Joanne Nelson. Katie, Joanne's sister, said that Joanne most likely did not know about his criminal history. Otherwise, she would not have continued the relationship or wanted children with him. Their story began on the streets where Paul worked as a security guard in bars and clubs. He was 27 and already experienced in relationships, while Joanne was just starting her journey into adulthood at the age of 19. Despite the age difference, they found support in each other, running away from their parents' control and looking for their own space. At first, they lived with Paul's mother, and then they could afford to buy their own house. But happiness was slowly disappearing, fading away like smoke from a fire. The days turned gray, and the tension grew between them. For Joanne, everything had become too mundane and boring. Their differences began to affect the relationship. She loved order, while he did not give it much thought. On February 14, 2005, Joanne did not come to work. This was unusual and caused immediate concern. As the investigation revealed more and more information, the previously quiet and peaceful town was overtaken by a wave of shocking lies and deception. Joanne Nelson, a cheerful and bright young woman, always put the happiness of her loved ones above her own. As a child, she lived with her parents in the town of Hull, also known as Kingston-upon-Hull, on the east coast of Yorkshire, England. Her mother, Jean, was a teaching assistant, and her father, Charlie, worked as an engineer for the city council. It was in this town that Joanne grew up and became who she was. Joanne had a bright personality and was successful both academically and socially. She was an active athlete who loved netball, lacrosse, and swimming. She lived happily, enjoying her youth, but always harbored a deep desire to create her own family. She initially tried her hand at medicine but the emotional toll of being a nurse proved too difficult for her. Her loved ones remember how she would come home saddened by the suffering of her patients. Later, Joanne considered working abroad, but ultimately chose to work at an employment center in Hull to be closer to her family and friends. She found fulfillment in making people's lives better by helping them find jobs and improve their skills. Joanne's dedication and kindness left a lasting impact on those around her making her absence even more profound and alarming when she did not show up for work that fateful February day. On Valentine's Day 2005, Joanne Nelson vanished without a trace, turning a day meant for love into a day of horror and mystery. Her disappearance was a nightmare for her parents. When her boyfriend reported her missing to the police, a sense of foreboding filled the air. That night turned dark and ominous, leaving Joanne's family and friends enveloped in fear and uncertainty. Instead of enjoying the evening with his beloved, Paul found himself speaking with the police. He claimed that the last time he saw Joanne was when she was asleep, and upon his return from work, she was gone. It was as if she had vanished into thin air, leaving only shadows of fear and hope behind. At 22 years old, Joanne's sudden disappearance caused great distress among her loved ones. The situation became even more perplexing when she missed significant events, such as her best friend's father's funeral and her sister Katie's 19th birthday. The police swiftly launched a large-scale search operation involving numerous law enforcement officers, military personnel, and volunteers. Joanne's father was vocal about his suspicions regarding Paul, questioning how he could be involved in the disappearance of such a responsible young woman. Katie, although aware of her father's concerns, found it hard to believe that Paul had any role in Joanne's vanishing. The family's worry and confusion only deepened as days turned into weeks without any sign of Joanne. Paul threw himself into the search efforts, collaborating with volunteers, concerned relatives, and friends. Despite lacking family consent, he granted multiple interviews to the press, keen to aid in the search. When questioned by a reporter over the phone, Paul vehemently denied any wrongdoing in Joanne's disappearance. He adamantly professed his love for her, asserting that he could never harm her. However, discrepancies emerged between his spoken words and his facial expressions. Expert Cliff Lansley scrutinized Paul's demeanor during a televised interview, identifying peculiarities. 
Notably, Paul failed to close his eyes while discussing Joanne, an anomaly for someone grappling with grief. Moreover, he displayed no signs of tears, raising suspicions. Further scrutiny came from Ray Higgins, the head of the investigation team at Humberside Police. Higgins reported observing nail marks on the back of Paul's hand, leading authorities to consider his potential involvement in Joanne's disappearance or death. Eventually, Paul's mother, unable to bear the emotional turmoil any longer, divulged crucial information about Paul's actions to the authorities, potentially shedding light on Joanne's fate. Upon learning of the accusations, Paul didn't attempt to refute his culpability. Just six days after Joanne's disappearance, he found himself in police custody. During a grueling interrogation, the truth emerged. On that fateful Valentine's Day in 2005, Paul committed the unthinkable act of ending Joanne's life in their own home. Paul recounted a tumultuous argument that escalated to irreparable heights. Joanne's constant criticism, particularly regarding household chores, served as the catalyst. According to Paul, Joanne's request for help with the washing machine triggered his anger and shame at his perceived inadequacy. Matters worsened when Joanne declared her intention to leave him and demanded the sale of their home for 110,000 euros, further fueling Paul's rage. In a fit of fury, Paul confessed to the police, admitting to strangling Joanne with his bare hands. Subsequently, he displayed chilling composure as he meticulously orchestrated the aftermath, intending to conceal his heinous deed. He craftily devised a plan, seeking to fabricate Joanne's sudden disappearance. With calculated precision, Paul proceeded to carry out his scheme. He engaged in casual interactions with neighbors and discussed banal topics like acquiring a pet, all while concealing the darkness within him. Surveillance footage captured his unnervingly composed demeanor as he purchased supplies, a testament to his disturbingly calm facade. Armed with garbage bags, rubber gloves, and disinfectant spray, Paul executed his plan methodically. He bound Joanne's limbs, encased her in bags, and sealed them with duct tape. Then, without hesitation, he transported her lifeless body to her vehicle, his audacity matched only by the magnitude of his crime. The audacious act unfolded in broad daylight, revealing Paul's cunning and deceitful nature. With chilling composure, he concealed his heinous deed from unsuspecting onlookers, demonstrating his ability to manipulate those around him effortlessly. After concealing Joanne's lifeless body in her own vehicle, Paul embarked on a calculated journey. Driving approximately 75 miles to the remote Bradbury Woodland near Winteringham in North Yorkshire, Paul carefully orchestrated each step. With meticulous precision, he carried Joanne's body through the dense forest, seeking a secluded burial site among the towering pines. Utilizing twigs to obscure the makeshift grave, Paul buried what he perceived as the love of his life. Returning to the victim's car, Paul resumed his facade of normalcy, showing no remorse or acknowledgement of his monstrous actions. He even fabricated a fake phone conversation with Joanne to divert suspicion, further highlighting his cold-blooded demeanor. Despite his attempts to deceive, Paul's consistent actions betrayed an alarming level of planning and premeditation. In the subsequent investigation, Paul's memory conveniently faltered regarding the exact location of Joanne's burial site. Detectives, led by the tenacious Ray Higgins, embarked on a painstaking six-week search across three counties. Finally, on March 24, after 39 days of agonizing uncertainty, the grim truth came to light. In a solemn operation led by Detective Phil Gadd, Joanne's remains were discovered in Bransby near York. Trembling with nerves, the search party followed Paul's descriptions until they stumbled upon the telltale signs, a garbage bag concealed beneath branches. Within it lay the heartbreaking evidence. Joanne's body, wrapped in plastic, a tragic confirmation of the family's worst fears. March 24 marked the end of a harrowing ordeal for Joanne's family, bringing closure to their anguished search while cementing the grim reality they had dreaded all along. Paul's facade of strength hid a dark history of sexual violence against women, a chilling truth kept hidden from Joanne's family and the public until the trial. During his time working as a security guard at the club, he ominously referred to himself as a psychopath, sending shivers down the spines of those who knew him. Witnesses familiar with Paul from the gym 
recounted instances where he instigated fights in clubs and bars, painting a disturbing picture of his character. As the trial unfolded, more unsettling details emerged. It was revealed that Paul had been experimenting with steroids in a misguided attempt to sculpt his physique into that of a bodybuilder. His friends disclosed that he had battled alcoholism in the past, and his violent outbursts were likely exacerbated by his steroid use. Paul's educational background provided little insight into the darkness lurking beneath his seemingly ordinary facade. He attended Sydney Smith School before enrolling at Howe College, where he successfully completed a program in constructional engineering. Despite his academic achievements, Paul's journey took a sinister turn when he pursued a degree in horticulture at Bishop Burton College, completing it at the tender age of 17. These revelations painted a chilling portrait of a man whose outward appearance belied the deep-seated demons lurking within. Paul's transformation from a seemingly ordinary student to a perpetrator of unspeakable violence left Joanne's family and the community reeling, grappling with the horrifying reality of the darkness that dwelled within him. Paul's journey through life took him from Saudi Arabia to Somerton Road, where he worked diligently in various industries alongside his father, Peter Dyson. Together, they navigated the maintenance industry, honed their gardening skills, and delved into the intricacies of machining. Paul's employment history painted a picture of a young man eager to carve out his path in the world of work. However, behind the veneer of normalcy lurked a disturbing truth. At the tender age of 15, Paul's life took a dark turn when he crossed paths with Colin Allen, a martial arts expert with whom he formed an unlikely bond. It was to Colin that Paul confessed to a heinous crime, a confession that ultimately led to his arrest. Paul's acquaintances shed light on his complex character. While some saw him as charming and attractive to women, others witnessed a more troubling side to his personality. He often leveraged his position as a security guard to forge connections with women from higher social echelons, revealing a distorted perception of himself and his interactions. Colleagues and relatives offered contrasting portraits of Paul, depicting him as both outspoken and boastful about his athletic prowess, yet also capable of making disturbing statements. Shockingly, Paul's family recounted instances where he proudly boasted about his father's involvement in the deaths of two individuals. This seemingly incredulous claim, however, proved to be rooted in reality. Paul's father, Peter Dyson, had indeed served time in prison for the manslaughter of 22-year-old John Dickinson, a man with whom his wife had been unfaithful. The tragic events of 1967 cast a shadow over Paul's upbringing, exposing him to the grim realities of life and death at a young age. Through Paul's tumultuous journey, a complex and unsettling portrait emerged, revealing the interplay between family history, personal choices, and the darkest depths of human nature. In 1974, a mere two days after Paul entered the world, tragedy struck with haunting consequences. Peter Dyson, his father, found himself entangled in a fatal accident. Behind the wheel, he collided with 47-year-old Gordon Kell, who was returning home after jubilantly celebrating a silver wedding anniversary. In a chilling turn of events, Peter fled the scene, leaving Gordon to perish on the roadside. Despite the gravity of the situation, Paul idolized his father, viewing him through a lens of admiration and heroism. The untimely demise of Peter in 2000, succumbing to a heart attack in the midst of their life in Saudi Arabia, left an indelible mark on Paul's psyche. It cast a shadow over his existence, shaping the trajectory of his fate in ways both profound and ominous. As the trial unfolded on November 7, 2005, a hushed courtroom bore witness to a startling revelation. Paul, in a dramatic turn of events, stunned onlookers by entering a guilty plea. Joanne's family, bracing themselves for a protracted and grueling legal battle, found themselves thrust into a realm of disbelief and uncertainty. In a moment of collective astonishment, they whispered affirmations as Paul's admission reverberated through the chamber. Throughout the proceedings, Paul maintained a stoic demeanor, his gaze fixed straight ahead or cast downward, deliberately avoiding the piercing stares of Joanne's grieving loved ones and the scrutiny of law enforcement. Not a flicker of emotion crossed his impassive countenance, not even during the formal announcement of the charges against him. 
His lawyer, Harry Barl, stood before the court, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. With unwavering resolve, he conceded that there could be no excuse for the heinous act perpetrated by his client. In the wake of Paul's shocking confession, a pall of solemnity descended upon the courtroom, marking the beginning of a harrowing journey toward justice and closure. On Tuesday, November 8th, nearly 10 months after the tragic murder, Paul received his sentence, life imprisonment with a minimum term of 16 years. Remarkably, just 14 years later, in November 2019, at the age of 45, Paul found himself transferred to an open prison and recommended for day release. The parole board cited Paul's active engagement in self-awareness programs and successful completion of an intensive interpersonal relationship improvement program. Recalling the day of Joanne's disappearance, Katie was struck by Paul's behavior. She now regrets offering him comfort when he appeared at her doorstep. Later, when Paul wandered off, Katie, consumed by worry, searched for him. Finding him at the bus stop, she squeezed his hands in an attempt to provide support as he sat there, overcome with emotion. She even embraced him, hoping to offer solace. Reflecting on the moment, Katie admitted she hadn't initially noticed the scratches on his arm, but upon later reflection, she couldn't forgive herself for missing them. The easing of Paul's detention conditions and the prospect of day release stirred deep emotional turmoil within Joanne's family. Katie, speaking to the media, expressed their sense of loss and confusion in the face of this news. Paul's impending release dredged up painful memories of Joanne's untimely death, leaving the family grappling with a sense of injustice. Despite their belief that Paul didn't deserve such leniency for his heinous actions, Costa Mesa 911. There's a body by the apartment. There's a what? A body. A dead body. A dead body? Except there's victim sexual activity. She's dead. There's blood from her head. Out. There was blood from her head? Yeah. On May 21, 2010, a young woman was found murdered in the apartment of 26 year old Army veteran Sam Hare. When Sam's father discovered the gruesome scene, they frantically dialed 911. Then I walk you to the bedroom. And that's what saw a body, a large amount of blood. I immediately called blood. But Sam was nowhere in sight. Who was that woman and what happened to her? Was Sam on the run after killing her? Located halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego, Costa Mesa, California lies on a coastal highland overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Despite its affluence, it's a laid back beach community at heart. No one anticipated that this beautiful place would be where Julie Kibalishi would meet her horrific end. Sam Hare's parents, Stephen and Raquel Hare, became concerned when they hadn't heard from their son in a while. Sam was supposed to go to his parents' house that weekend, but he never showed up. On May 22, 2010, Stephen went to Sam's apartment along with his wife. There, a horrendous scene was awaiting them. Sam, what happened? What, what, what did you do? Panic-stricken, he immediately dialed 911. In this frantic call, Steve alerted the police that there was a dead woman lying face down in his son's bedroom with some of her clothes ripped off and blood coming down from her forehead. However, Sam was nowhere in sight. The incident came as a shock for the Costa Mesa community, where murders are very rare. When police reached the apartment, they did not find any signs that a struggle had taken place. Immediately as you walk in, I mean, you could tell it was a bachelor type apartment. It was a theater part where there was no signs that there may have been a struggle or you know, maybe a fight that you've had gone on. The apartment seemed to be filled with items you'd find in a typical bachelor pad. Empty beer bottles, burnt cigarettes, a patio barbecue. But it looked relatively clean and neat. That is, until they entered the bedroom. Then in the bedroom, which begins to look a little suspicious, on the bedside table, there's an unused knife and there's a couple of books, one of them a combat how-to, another the wonders of sex. But then when you turn to the bed, a horrendous son. The bed was soaked red from the victim's blood. 
The deceased woman was lying partially on the bed and partially kneeling on the ground. Her pants were pulled down, exposing the lower portion of her body. From the looks of it, detectives concluded that she might have been sexually assaulted before her death. She died from two gunshot wounds to her head. He had one gunshot wound, uh, top, set her above the head. There was also a knife on the bedside table, but it appeared to be unused. Strangely, she was wearing a tiara and scrawled on the back of her sweater were the words, all yours, her bag was found in the kitchen. From her driver's license, detectives identified the victim as 23-year-old Julie Kibuishi. Julie Kibuishi was born on Valentine's Day, 1987, to Japanese-American parents, Jun and Masa Kibuishi. Ju was the third of four children and their first daughter. She'd always been referred to as my Valentine girl by her parents. From a very young age, Julie took a keen interest in dance and music. Her mother said Julie started tap dancing when she was just five and that passion only grew over the years. According to her friends and family, she was a pleasure to be around. Her goofy and bubbly personality made everyone laugh. Not only did she exude positivity, but she often bent over backwards to help a friend in need. On one hand, she respected her Japanese culture, but on the other, she was a free-spirited, all-American girl. After graduating high school from the Orange County School of the Arts, Julie went on to study fashion design at Orange Coast Community College. Here, she met 26-year-old Sam Hare, and the two became close. She also tutored him in anthropology. She did not know that her kindness would cost her life. After scouring through the crime scene, detectives tried to piece together what had happened to this bright and beautiful young woman. All signs pointed to Sam being her killer. It was, after all, his apartment that she was found in, and now he was nowhere to be found. It was time for investigators to take a closer look at Sam Hare. Samuel Hare was born on May 29, 1983, to parents Stephen Raquel Halberman in Los Angeles, California. As the only child to his special education teacher father and stay-at-home mother, Sam was doted on. He was very close to his parents, visiting them often even after he'd moved away. Although Sam's physical stature was big and strong, his friends described him as a big teddy bear. He was a fun-loving and easygoing guy. At a very young age, Sam had enlisted in the United States Army and served a tour of duty in Afghanistan and in Germany with 173rd Airborne. After three years, he was discharged and returned to Southern California where he was born and raised to attend college on the GI Bill. He wanted to finish college and then re-enlist in the army as an officer. With that goal in mind, Sam Hare enrolled himself in Orange Coast Community College, where he formed a friendship with Julie, who was three years younger than him. But just like many war heroes, Sam developed PTSD from the three years he served in the army. Had he somehow snapped and committed the crime in a moment of passion? As Sam was nowhere to be found, Detectives concluded that he was most likely on the run after murdering Julie in his own apartment. The suspicion only grew stronger when they found text messages on Julie's phone from Sam's number. At around 2.45 p.m. on May 21, 2010, Sam sent her a text saying he was going to help a friend and then head out to go to his parents' house. However, just two hours later, his tone changed when he sent her a couple of texts begging her to come to his place. From the tone of the messages, Sam seemed like a man in trouble. He was clearly upset about something. As a concerned friend, Julie agreed to meet Sam. She said she'd be there for him like a family. While Sam's family was dumbfounded by the findings and worried that his life was in danger, these texts made him look more guilty to the investigators. It showed that he planned for her to come over. Additionally, Sam's car and his passport were also missing from the apartment, leading investigators to believe that Sam was probably on the run. His passport was missing. His car was missing. I look at it every legal clock as this is obvious. Uh, five, see how he is Gabriel Killer. Yet investigators would soon find out that there was even more to this story. Flashing back to eight years prior, in 2002, the then 18-year-old Sab Hare was charged with another heinous crime. He was accused of taking part 
along with 17 other men and women, in the stabbing and beating death of 19-year-old Byron Benito in Canyon Country. Allegedly, on the night of January 15, 2002, Sam, who had been friends with Benito since childhood, picked Benito up from his house and led his unsuspecting friend to an area behind a mobile home park where he was attacked and killed by a group of suspected gang members. He was charged with murder. However, in the end, he was acquitted of those charges. But that didn't change the suspicion in the minds of the investigators. Although Sam's family did not believe in his guilt, investigators were almost certain that they were after the right person. As Sam was trained to use firearms, they considered him armed and dangerous and on the run. Believing that they had a dangerous killer on the loose, authorities put an APB out for Sam. Meanwhile, the Custom Mesa police began monitoring Sam's cell phone and credit card activities in an attempt to locate him. Cops got information that there had been four withdrawals made from ATNs in the days since his disappearance. His credit card was also used at a pizza delivery place in Long Beach, California, just 20 miles away from Sam's house. Police expected to see Sam on the surveillance cameras, but when the bank sent them footage from the ATM cameras, they couldn't believe whom they were seeing. It was a teenager, wearing a hoodie and a cap, withdrawing money from Sam's bank account. Neither police nor Sam's parents were able to identify the kid. Investigators concluded that he was most likely helping Sam, either to get away or to hide. Either way, Customesa police were desperate to track him down. On May 26, 2010, they received information that his credit card had been used at another pizza delivery, and they set about tracking the delivery driver. After obtaining the delivery address from them, police headed to the address to apprehend Sam, thinking that they'd finally found his hideout spot. When police stormed the house, expecting to find Sam, they instead found 17-year-old Wesley Freelich along with some of his friends. Although suspected earlier, authorities almost immediately ruled out Wesley as a suspect, but he did still have Sam's credit card in possession. The teenager depicted a shocking story that investigators were not anticipating hearing. He was, in fact, given the credit card with full instructions to withdraw cash. However, it was not by Sam. He didn't even know Sam. Daniel Wozniak, a local theater actor whom Wesley met through community theater, had given them the credit card. Wozniak told Wesley that he was a bail bondsman and needed to collect money Sam owed. Perhaps any other person would have declined it, but as Wesley looked up to Wozniak as an older brother, without realizing the gravity of the situation, the 17-year-old boy agreed to help. In total, $1,900 was withdrawn from the account. The name Daniel Wozniak did ring a bell for investigators, as they'd found an invitation to his upcoming wedding in Sam's apartment. But who was this Daniel Wozniak, and what was his connection to Sam? Did he help Sam to get away, or was he an accomplice to the murder itself? Several questions were yet to be answered. 38-year-old Daniel Dan Patrick Wozniak was born on March 23, 1984, as the youngest of three boys. Daniel spent a lot of time with his grandparents after school due to his parents' long work hours. Dan grew up in a luxurious home and the family often took expensive vacations. He was described as a good kid in school who mostly got very good grades. He used jokes, singing, dancing, and magic tricks to get attention from people. He loved to be the center of attention. Realizing that he had a natural talent for stage performance, Daniel started acting and singing in musicals in his early 20s. He was pretty casual about his plans for the future. He could never hold a job for long, which forced him to move from job to job with very low pay. However, as years passed, he kept his passion for acting alive and continued to work in theater. It was here, in one of his musicals, that he found the woman of his dreams, a fellow actress. After briefly dating, they decided to marry. On May 26, 2010, when police tracked down Wozniak, he was enjoying his bachelor party in Huntington Beach, California. But how was Daniel Wozniak linked to Sam Hare? As it turned out, he lived in the same apartment complex where Sam lived. Assuming that Wozniak had either helped Sam flee or hide, or had been complicit in Julie's murder, 
Cops barged into the private bachelor party for Wozniak with an arrest warrant. The blood drained from his face as soon as he saw the cops, leading the detectives to believe that he knew more than he was letting on. Police took him into custody for questioning. In the interrogation room, at first, Wozniak claimed that his only crime was participating in credit card fraud and covering for Sam. He further told the investigators that he and Sam hatched a plan to pull out all of his money from his bank account with the help of Wesley and then claim credit card theft. But Daniel claimed before they could carry out the plan, Sam made a shocking confession. He added that, after this confession, he dropped Sam off at a local shopping center and had not seen him since. Nonetheless, detectives believed he was still covering for Sam and that he had more involvement in Julie's murder than he told the investigators. So detectives tried a different strategy. They took a DNA swab from Daniel, a strategy that made Daniel very nervous. He tried to collect his composure, but detectives could tell there was something wrong. Almost immediately, he started to add more details to the story. Tell me about uh, uh, the saying that said that really what you did. Um, I told him that I needed to go see stuff from the theater. I said, me need to do help me learn this then. I didn't really mind to get that reverse up the back in a shot. Detectives realized that Wozniak was nervous that his DNA would show up at Sam's apartment. Although he tried to say otherwise, cracking under pressure, he kept changing his story. After a long pause, Wozniak said that he knew about Julius' murder and he helped him get away. When detectives reminded him that they had his DNA, he reassured them that it was not going to show up on Julie's body. He was still holding on to the fact that he had nothing to do with the murder. Detectives were expecting that Wozniak would reveal more details when he suddenly decided he was done with the interview. But with so much at stake, detectives could not let him go easily without knowing the full details. They told Wozniak that he'd be arrested for the accessory to murder charge if he did not come clean and give them full details. Wozniak had a lot at stake too. He had a wedding scheduled in just 48 hours, and he did not want to miss it. Under pressure, Wozniak started to crumble. The story yet again changed a bit. Seeing that Wozniak was about to break, detectives hastened the process by bluffing about the DNA. Although in reality, DNA test results wouldn't be back for weeks, detectives claimed his DNA was found on Julie's body. Shockingly, he did not protest the claim. He rather said his DNA was on Julie's body because he was standing right over her body. As it turns out, Wozniak was not as good of an actor in the interrogation room as he was on the stage. As his lies fell apart, he dropped yet another bombshell. This was a major red flag for the detectives because only one gunshot wound was visible to the investigators at the crime scene. Only later, when an autopsy was performed, was it revealed that there was a second gunshot wound. This confession from Wozniak meant that he'd been there when she was killed, which made him an accomplice in the murder, and investigators could now officially detain him. Yet, even though Wozniak was in custody, detectives still had to find Sam, and Daniel refused to talk. While detectives were searching for any clues that could lead them to Sam Hare, sitting behind bars, Wozniak called his fiancée, Rachel Buffett. Whether Wozniak knew those conversations were being recorded or not, he was about to get caught in his own web of lies. As Rachel chose freedom over love, she told him that she was going to call detectives with more information. Wozniak knew he had to talk to the detectives before Rachel could. Suddenly, he was in a panic, desperate to strike the deal with the detectives that he refused only hours before. But what he told the detectives this time was beyond their imagination. For the first time, Wozniak was ready to break down the timeline of his diabolical murder plan, which started with a simple favor from a friend. On the fateful day of May 21, 2010, Wozniak asked Sam, who considered him a good friend, to help move some boxes at the Los Alamitos Theater attic in a local military base. While Sam was busy moving the boxes in the attic, in a note-down position with his back turned to Wozniak, the cold-blooded monster pulled out a gun and shot him in the head once. Initially, Sam never knew what hit him. 
After realizing he'd been shot, he begged Wozniak to help him. Without a shred of hesitation, this merciless killer reloaded his gun and shot him a second time, killing him instantly. After killing Sam, he was still not finished. In a cold and composed manner, he did the unthinkable by texting Julie from Sam's phone and luring her to Sam's apartment. In the utmost callousness, he left Sam's body in the attic and went to perform his play, laughing, singing, dancing, as if he did not just murder an innocent man and lure another to the same fate. Later in the night, Wozniak snuck into Sam's apartment, and once Julie was inside the apartment, he showed her two times in the head. He then staged the crime scene to make it look like Sam fled after assaulting and killing Julie in his apartment. However, he still needed to make sure that no one found Sam. In desperation, he proceeded to commit one of the most depraved acts possible. He returned to the attic and dismembered Sam's hands and head in an attempt to conceal the deceased's identity. He disposed of them at a nearby park. But even after these heinous acts, seemingly without a care in the world, Wozniak once again returned to the theater. In several cast party photos detectives collected later, he can be seen laughing and joking with other members. But perhaps the motive remains even more twisted than the murders themselves. It all boiled down to money. Loaded behind uh, uh, killing Sam was mm, Muddy and Sam. <laughs> Wozniak always struggled with money and maintaining employment. At the time of the murders, he was behind two months in rent on the verge of getting evicted. Additionally, he had no way of paying for the grand wedding or honeymoon he planned. And that's when he learned of the $62,000 Sam had in his savings for his time served in the military. He killed two innocent people in cold blood so that he could have a grand wedding and enjoy an expensive vacation. If the confession was not enough, police found the evidence bag that Rachel talked about on the phone with Wozniak, thanks to Wozniak's brother, Tim. Tim had instructions to get rid of the bag, but he instead threw it over the fence at his parents' house. That backpack was filled with incriminating evidence, including Sam Hare's financial details, passport, his bloody clothes, and, most damning of all, the murder weapon. Wozniak's DNA was all over the items, suggesting that he, and he alone, committed the double homicide. There was a cornucopia of others, of the DNA, expedited shell cases, the victim's financial information, everything a prosecutor could ever warrant, but of course, that also led us to the murder weapon himself. On December 16th, 2015, at the end of his trial, which lasted just five days, Wozniak was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. On January the 11th, 2016, after only one hour of deliberation, in what's described as one of the shortest death penalty deliberations, the jury recommended the death penalty to a very deserving Daniel Wozniak. On September 23, 2016, the judge sentenced him to death. It seemed like there was no end of deception in this case. Detectives discovered years later that Wozniak's former fiancée, Rachel Buffett, not only knew about the murder plots, but she'd been deceptive to the detectives. Though she denied all these allegations, she was arrested and charged with three felony counts of accessory after the fact, based on allegations that she'd lied multiple times to police investigators. On September 12, 2018, she was convicted on two of those counts with a maximum possible sentence of 44 months, and on November 8, 2018, was sentenced to 32 months behind bars. She was released from jail sometime in 2019. Life snatched away from two innocent people, life destroyed for their family members. And all of this, just so one mania could have his dream honeymoon. The only closure that the families can get from this is that this monster is spending his last days where he can't hurt anybody else.